When we strive for the good or the beautiful, we forget our essence, which is differentiation, and we fall subject to the spell of the qualities of the pleroma, which are the pairs of opposites. We endeavor to attain the good and the beautiful, yet at the same time we also seize the evil and the ugly. Hi everyone, welcome to my YouTube channel. In this video I will be talking about the sixth volume of Carl Jung's Black Books, and then in particular his idea of the concept of the Pleroma, which is quite a complicated topic, but also really interesting, especially the way in which Carl Jung tries to apply this, this concept. So this video is also a part of a series of seven videos, and in each video I uh, address each volume of the Black Books separately. So if you do not want to miss the following uh, volume as well, then please also consider subscribing to this YouTube channel. So just as a short summary of the last volume, uh, throughout the fifth volume of the Black Books, Carl Jung explored the idea of the shadow in particular, and Carl Jung discussed the meaning of this idea of the shadow and how an integration of one's shadow can be beneficial. Carl Jung indicated that the shadow entails the darker sides of one's personality, which is which one is reluctant to show to the world. However, as long as this shadow remains in the darkness, its power can grow as well. So Carl Jung he wrote, whoever looks into the mirror of the water will see first of all his own image. Whoever goes to himself risks a confrontation with himself. The mirror does not flatter. It faithfully shows whatever looks into it, namely the face we never show to the world because we cover it with the persona, the mask of the actor. But the mirror lies behind the mask and shows the true face. So far, the volumes of the Black Books, they can all be characterized by these, by the exploration of opposites. So unconsciousness and consciousness, shadow and light, good and evil. And in the sixth volume, Carl Jung is, through the exploration of, the, of his own unconscious world, attempting to unite these opposites. In this regard, the idea of the Pleroma is important as an overarching principle. As you will see, however, the idea of the Pleroma is not introduced in order to to attempt to reduce the differences between these opposites. Instead, unification can be achieve, achieved through further differentiation, which doesn't yet make a, lot of, makes a lot of sense, but hopefully at the end of the video it does. So the idea of the Pleroma is a Christian concept. However, when Carl Jung refers to the Pleroma, he refers to the, to the definition of the Gnostics. I've made a separate video about the Gnostics, which you can find somewhere on your screen now as well. Uh, translated literally, the term pleroma means fullness. And the way that Carl Jung defines the term, I believe that the, that the pleroma can be seen as the supreme essence of everything that is, has ever been, and will ever be. As soon as an object or organism comes into existence, it is however differentiated from the pleroma because it will have developed an identity which the pleroma has not. So Carl Jung here wrote, that which is endless and eternal has no qualities, since it, since it has all qualities. We call this nothingness or fullness the pleroma. Therein both thinking and being cease, since the eternal and endless possess no qualities. No one is in it, for he would then be distinct from the pleroma, and would possess qualities that would distinguish him as something distinct from the pleroma. Uh, so depending on how one believes the universe was created, one might be able to compare the pleroma to God or to Mother nature or to any other creating entity. However, as Carl Jung indicated, defining the pleroma is actually impossible simply because it is everything but also nothing, he wrote. In the pleroma there is nothing and everything. It is fruitless to think about the pleroma, for this would mean self-dissolution. At the same time, however, Carl Jung indicated that we are ultimately connected to the pleroma. He wrote, but we are the pleroma. For we are enclosed in and part of the eternal and the endless, but we have no share therein, as we are infinitely removed from the pleroma, not spaciously or temporally, but essentially, since we are dis distinguished from the pleroma in our essence as creation, which is confined within time and space. The pleroma is not confined in this time and space. So one might wonder why the term pleroma can be useful if it cannot be properly defined. However, it is exactly because it cannot be defined that it is a useful term. Carl Jung argued that because we are a part of the pleroma, although we are infinitely removed from it, 
The Pleroma is also a part of us, he wrote. We are also the Pleroma itself. Hence I say that we are not in the Pleroma, but we are it. Figuratively, the Pleroma is the smallest point in us and the boundless firmament about us. In this way, the term can also be used to indicate how everything, past, present and future, is connected to each other. Everything exists as a part of the Pleroma. However, Carl Jung comes with an extremely interesting explanation as to why the idea of the Pleroma is important. According to Jung, a creature exists because it can differentiate. He or she can differentiate him or herself from other objects and organisms, and therefore he or she is, is, uh, as a verb. Since we, from our state of being, cannot define the pleroma, we, through our differentiation, exist. He wrote, when we distinguish the qualities of the pleroma, we are speaking from the ground of our own differentiated state, and about our own differentiation, but have effectively said nothing about the pleroma. Yet we need to speak about our own differentiation, so that we may sufficiently differentiate ourselves. Carl Jung attached great value to this differentiation. He argued that if we do not differentiate, we cease to be. He wrote, if we do not differentiate, we move beyond our essence, beyond creation, and we fall into non-differentiation. We fall into the pleroma, pleroma itself and cease to be created being. We lapse into dissolution in eternity and endlessness. This is the death of the creature. Therefore we die to the same extent that we do not differentiate. Hence the creature's essence strives towards differentiation. This is called the Principium Individuationis. So as you can see, the idea of the Pleroma is quite complicated. However, after this initial discussion on the definition or the lack of the definition of the Pleroma, we can see how Carl Jung attempted to apply this term in a more practical sense. Jung observed that the Pleroma consists of many pairs of opposites, good and evil, dead or alive, beauty and ugliness, etc. As indicated in the introduction, Jung explored many of these opposites throughout the black books. However, in light of the idea of the Pleroma, Jung explained that as soon as one attempts to pursue one of these opposites, for example good, one falls prey to the spell of the Pleroma because the good cannot be without its opposite, evil. He wrote, when we strive for the good or the beautiful, we forget our essence, which is differentiation, and we fall subject to the spell of the qualities of the Pleroma, which are the pairs of opposites. We endeavor to attain the good and the beautiful, yet at the same time we also seize the evil and the ugly, since in the Pleroma these are one with the good and the evil. If we, however, remain true to our own essence and do not fail, fall prey to the Pleroma, we can move beyond these pairs of opposites, according to Jung. He wrote, But if we do the same in the name and under the sign of our essence, which is differentiation, we differentiate ourselves from the good and the beautiful, and hence from the evil and ugly. And thus we do not fall, fall under the spell of the Pleroma. And I believe that actually a lot of Jung's work is dedicated to this idea of the Principium individuatio, Individuationis, the way in which one is differentiated from others. Carl Jung, he believed it to be extremely important to pursue the true essence within oneself, especially before one attempts to define the qualities of the world. He wrote, At bottom, therefore, there is only one striving, namely the striving for the essence in you. If you had the striving, you would not need to know anything about the Pleroma and its qualities, and yet you would attain the right goal by virtue of your own essence. Since, however, thought alienates us from our essence, I must teach you that knowledge with which you can riddle your thoughts. So the idea of the Pleroma is rather complicated. However, as we've seen, it can be used to explain how important it is to pursue our own true essence. In simpler terms, the Pleroma can be used to explain why it is important to pursue who one really is. If one does not do so, one can fall under the spell of the Pleroma and therefore, well, in the words of Carl Jung, literally cease to be. So that brings us to the end of this video. Please let me know if you can now somehow understand this concept of the Pleroma. And if you do not want to miss the following video in the Black Books, which will be about the last volume, volume 7, then please also consider subscribing to this YouTube channel. So thank you for watching and I hope to see you in the next video as well.